Hello guys, how are you doing this afternoon? I did want to check in with you guys this week for my weekly vlog just to let everyone know, you know, what's been going on with me, what's been going on, you know, with my husband Cornelius and what's been going on with our daughter Carl Emery. So for those of you who don't know, the title of this vlog is Carl Emery's World. If you want more background information, you can check out vlog number one, which is titled The Story of Carl. So, so basically, my daughter was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder at 21 months old. And so we are using this vlog just to chronicle our journey and just so that everyone can get a view into our daily lives. And the purpose is for parents and other people who are dealing with what we are dealing with to be able to view our story and hopefully gain some hope. And if they want to, you know, dialogue and also become friends and support one another, we're happy to do that as well. So this week, we've been dealing with a lot of transitions. And one of the big ones is that, you know, Carl is about to be three years old. So when she turns three years old, she will transition to her county school district's public preschool. There is a special needs preschool that she'll transition to. So that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today. I'm going to talk about, you know, our process, getting from where we are now to getting to the public school district preschool when she turns three years old. So Carl has been enrolled in the state of Georgia's early intervention program since she was 12 months old. This program is called Babies Can't Wait. It's actually a birth to three program, but she started at 12 months because that's when a lot of her symptoms manifested. And that is when we recognized that she needed a lot of supportive care and supportive therapy. So the good thing to know is that Anyone who feels like there is an issue with the development of their child or who feels like their child needs to be assessed for developmental delays, missed, missed milestones, autism spectrum disorder, you know, various conditions, you can self-refer to your state's early intervention program. In the state of Georgia, a referral is not required. So you don't have to go through a pediatrician. You don't have to go through a healthcare provider. All you have to do is look up the information for the early intervention program. You call that number. You tell them that you're concerned about your child and you want an assessment and then you know you go through the application process and your child is assessed so when Carl turned 12 months old there were a lot of skills that she didn't have that I thought that she should have so the 12 months is the cutoff for a lot of those things and so the day after her first birthday I I actually looked up the information for our county's Babies Can't Wait Early Intervention Program. So I called and left a message and I also followed up via email and I was contacted back and I gave all of the information on call and then we were assigned a caseworker. So what the caseworker did was she scheduled call for her evaluations. So Carl had her evaluations and it did show that she was testing below her age range in all areas. So because of this, she qualified for the early intervention program. So the way I understand it is that the child would either need to have a severe developmental delay in one area or mild to moderate in two areas to qualify for Babies Can't Wait or whatever your state's early intervention program. And definitely fact check that. So Carl did qualify and at that point, she was assigned an early intervention specialist and her early intervention specialist has been doing therapy with her in all areas of development once a week for about a year and then after that we have now spaced it to twice a month so from every week to every other week just because 
Carly is doing so well. So we were able to kind of space that out a little bit. And then now she's in other therapies as well. So we definitely wanted to have time to complete those. And so she's been in this program since she was 12 months old. It's been fantastic. We love her therapist and she has seen a lot of great progress through this program. So the way it works is that she does her therapies and then we have a meeting every six months with her caseworker to discuss where she is. And we discuss goals met and then we will create new goals based on where she is. And so we've been doing that since she was 12 months old. And now because she's almost two and a half, we're starting to discuss what's next because the current program is the birth to three program. So next she will move on to the next phase, which will be three years old until 21 years old. And so that is what the meeting was to talk about. So the meeting was with me, my husband, the lead diagnostician. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, but if I'm not, you guys know what I mean. It's basically the neat, um, the lead person who assesses children and where they are in their development. So we met with this person for our county school district, and they just kind of explained to us how the progress would go when it comes to transitioning her from the birth to three program to the three-year-old to 21-year-old program. And so that's really what I'm going to talk about today. So basically what we did was we discussed her transition from Babies Can't Wait to the school district special education preschool program. And we were also given the information of her home school, which is the school that she will attend, which is in our area. And so we actually learned a lot of good information in this meeting. And there was a lot of things in, you know, that we discussed that I didn't know. And so I just wanted to go over it because sharing is caring. So there is something called the IDEA Act, and this is the Disabilities Education Act. And I definitely recommend that everyone go online and research that and read um, it in its entirety. And that'll basically tell you what your child's rights are in terms of education, what they're entitled to, the law, etc. And that is called the IDEA Act. So that is I-D-E-A Act which is the Disabilities Education Act. And so as it was explained to us, this means that you are entitled to special education from birth to 21 years old if you have developmental delays and certain conditions. So the first part of it is early intervention, which is birth to three. And then the second part of it is special education via the school system. And that is the three-year-old to 21-year-old. Now, one of the thing, things that they did explain to me is that Carl's special education school record would be confidential and kept from away from the rest of her school record. So if someone were to need access to her school record, there would be no mention of special education and none of her special education records would be a part of that record that they received unless I signed off on that. And from what I understand, this is something um, that is confidential um, and the law definitely protects Carl in the right to keep her information confidential. The other thing that they explained to me is that they like for the child to be in the least restrictive environment and that they encourage interactions with neurotypical children. So, if a child is doing well in a neurotypical preschool, they would not remove them from that environment and put them into a special education preschool unless it's necessary or in their best interest. So all children with 
autism spectrum disorder do not require special education services. It really just depends on your level of care, whether or not you have intellectual disabilities, and it's really your specific individual needs is very much so based on that specific child. And so what was explained to me is that there is a daily preschool that she could potentially attend up to five days a week, but everybody doesn't attend five days a week. Some children do half days, some children do whole days, some children do a couple of times a week, and then some children just come for a couple of hours a week for very specific programs or very specific services that they need. And one of the things that I was really excited about is that they did tell us that there are adaptive art and adaptive music classes available. I think that that is something that would be fantastic for Carl. And I think that it is excellent that they do have those extracurricular activities built into the program. So the other thing we went through was just, you know, how I would apply for this program. So I did do my application last night. And what I had to do was I had to fill out two applications. So one was called a request for assistance application. And this was just an application where I included her demographics, her skill level, her diagnosis, and then the types of therapies that she has received in the past. And then the other application was just a county school district registration packet. And that's just the typical registration form that all parents fill out before their child starts school in a particular school district. So I had to give supporting documents such as ID, birth certificate, evaluation records, therapy records, and you know, something that states what her official diagnosis is. The other thing that they did tell me is that a hearing eval slash clearance is required for her to enter this program. And the basic point for that is just to ensure that there is nothing such as hearing loss or, you know, poor vision that is going to interfere with her ability to do well. So they do require a form 3300. And that's basically just a form where, you know, you take it to your pediatrician and they have to sign off saying that they've assessed, you know, nutrition, dental, vision and hearing. So once we get the applications in, once we get all of the forms in, then, you know, they will review her ap application and they will have a diagnostic team that will do an evaluation on her and they will evaluate her in all areas of development. So these areas are communication, gross motor, fine motor, problem solving, and personal social. And it is this evaluation that is going to determine her needs, going to determine what she qualifies for, going to determine her services that she'll receive. And the IEP, which is her individualized education program, will be based on this. So I want to reiterate, it's not that Carl has autism spectrum disorder, so she will automatically go to a special education preschool five days a week, or she will automatically go to certain therapies a couple of hours a week. It really is individualized based on the child and based on their specific needs. And that is one of the things that I really like about this program. I love the fact that it's individualized. I love the fact that they have the music and art classes. I love the fact that her record is going to be kept confidential and we don't have to worry about, you know, anyone, you know, breaching our privacy. I, I really think that this program is going to be excellent for her because honestly, I liked everything that I heard. You know, I've heard horror stories about children going into kindergarten, never having been assessed, never having a diagnosis. There's a clear need to put certain therapies or services is in place, but the, the legwork hasn't been done prior to then so that they can start those services immediately. So there's a delay in them receiving the things that they need. And this is one of the things that I definitely do not want to happen to Carl. 
I don't want her first time entering this school system to be when she is entering kindergarten. I want her to already be a part of the school system, to already have an IEP in place, for them to already be familiar with her. And I really think that this program is going to give her a leg up, you know, starting two years earlier than she would have traditionally started. So I'm actually really excited about it. And I'm very grateful and thankful for the organization and the fact that things are being done ahead of time. As I said, she's due to start this program at three years old. Well, she's not even two and a half yet. And they're already contacting me like, hey, you know, fill out this application. This is what we need to do. This is how it works. Let's have this meeting. And I'm a very organized person and I like to do things in a timely manner. And so I appreciate that wholeheartedly. So Carl turns three years old in May. So she will basically start this program after the summer in August of next year when school starts back. And so we have plenty of time to prepare. We have plenty of time to get all of her documents in because it is a lot. You know, we have to give them all of her therapy records all of her assessments and so I just appreciate them giving us enough time to where we can get this done and there's not a lot of pressure on us to do it in a short amount of time so what I've done I've sent them everything that I have that's available right now but there are certain things that they can't get until it's almost time for her to go for example they're going to need the latest therapy records they're going to need her latest well child check they're going to need her latest immunization records so there's no point in me sending it now because it won't it'll be out of date by the time she starts so what I want to talk about next is an IEP. This is an individualized education program. I recommend everybody who feels there's an issue with your child, I recommend that you definitely research IEPs. I recommend that you definitely research 504 plans. Definitely know the difference and, you know, understand which one your child needs, why they need that. And if you need to get an advocate or somebody to, you know, go over things, with you, then definitely consider doing that as well. So Carl's IEP will address her unique abilities and needs and also will describe how she will assess her general curriculum. And so, like I said, I do want this now to ensure a smooth transition to kindergarten. Now, the one good thing I love about the IEP is that they explained to me that no meetings concerning Carl's education will take place or occur without us being present. Now, Carl is lucky, you know, because her aunt, um, her godmother is an educator and she's been an educator for over 20 years. She's currently a school administrator in Georgia, but she has previously served as an IEP chair and a 504 plan chair of her grade level for several years when she was teaching. And she has hands-on experience teaching and accommodating autistic children. So she wasn't a special education teacher. She was a general education teacher but she did have autistic children in her classroom just due to the fact that the state of Georgia puts children in the least restrictive environment and I really do love the idea of a least restrictive environment because that was always you know my concern I'm new to this so I, I didn't know you know that there was an opportunity for for her to receive her education in the presence of neurotypical children and, you know, then receive services one-on-one -on -one when she needs to in small groups when she needs to in a different setting. I saw something online that I really, 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 really liked. And basically what it said was that special education is not a place. Special education is simply the services that your child will receive receive to meet their needs. Now, I do know, you know, that some people, you know, they they feel, you know, a certain way about their children being designated as being in special education 
or you know special ed and you know they're they're fearful of their child being labeled but i think that the way that the school districts are doing it now in terms of treating it as services and not a place and making sure that everything is confidential and private i i really i really like this and honestly I, I am I'm happy to accept the services that are provided to us because I really think that those will be helpful for Carl in the long run. And so, you know, we are, I said that I was going to talk about, you know, the various transitions. So that is one of the transitions where, you know, getting things started in terms of transitioning her from Babies Can't Wait, which is Georgia's early intervention program, to the county school district for special needs preschool. But we we also have some other transitions going on as well. So Carl has Medicaid, which is Katie Beckett Medicaid. She also has private insurance, but the Katie Beckett Medicaid is a supplement and it helps with her co-pays and it also helps with her deductibles. Well, when she was first diagnosed, she did not have Medicaid. So we found an ABA company through our private insurance. Well, she's still with that ABA company, but they do not accept Medicaid. And so basically we're using our private insurance, which is okay because, you know, we've met our deductible for the year and everything is being covered at 100%. Well, in January, it will no longer be covered at 100%. And so we will have an, a deductible and co that is a significant amount of money. So I have been looking for a new ABA company that accepts her insurance and accepts her Medicaid. And I'm happy to report that I did find an ABA company that can do her in-home ABA that can work with our schedules and they have already spoken to Medicaid and Medicaid is saying that they will cover Carl's ABA 100% so there will not be a single out-of-pocket expense for us. So we do plan on transitioning her to the new ABA company at the beginning of the year before our co-pays and deductibles start over now there might be some you know lapsing care you know while they fully transition her but we're aware of that and we're going to prepare for it and her father and i we're just really going to make sure that we continue to do things with her at home until she gets in with the new aba company the other thing that we're currently doing is we're switching speech therapy companies right now. And the reason we're doing that is just because we need to find someone who is familiar and comfortable with working with autistic children and who recognizes Carl's unique needs. Because Carl actually isn't currently in speech therapy. So she's actually had two speech therapy evaluations and after those testings they actually said that she did not have any deficits in speech well i had to force the issue the second time and because of that they did do weekly therapy on her but they did four sessions and they discharged her so i spoke to her developmental pediatrician about it and she felt like there was still room for carl and that carl could benefit from speech therapy so she she encouraged us to find another company and so that's what we've done and so so far they have her on the books for every for once a week for an hour but we go for our initial eval with this company next week and so in the meantime we've just been trying to gather all of her records and everything to give to them one of the things that is really important is finding a therapist that is a good fit for your child so with us you know, if Carl is in therapy and we don't feel like it's a good fit and we don't feel like she's getting what she needs, we are perfectly fine letting go of that therapist or that therapy company. And we are perfectly fine with finding someone else. And we recognize that, you know, if we have to let go of a therapist and she has to be on a wait list or we can't get her in right away, we recognize that we'll have to, you know, work with her at home. And we are so certainly glad to do that because you know the one thing we are not gonna do we're not gonna work with anybody who from our viewpoint it doesn't seem like they're interested in helping her or it doesn't feel like they're comfortable taking care of her 
or they're not comfortable working with a child as small as her or as active as her or who has the specific needs that she has, I can tell you, I have definitely gotten rid of several therapists and I'm sure before it's over, I will get rid of many more. I have no problem going toe to toe with therapists, going toe to toe with health professionals, going toe to toe with educators, going toe to toe with whomever I need to, to make sure that my child gets what she needs. Because from my standpoint and my husband's standpoint, the words of therapists are not law, the the words of healthcare professionals are not law. And I'm a doctor. I'm a doctor, but I know that what I say isn't law. I do joint decision making with my patients and I definitely, you know, give them the opportunity to take a role in, you know, making informed healthcare decisions. And I want the same done for me when I take my child to the doctor as well, because I feel like nobody can reach Carl like I can reach her and like her dad could reach her. You know, if I rely solely on others to decide her future, I really don't think that, you know, she would be doing as well as she is because it is, you know, my motherly instinct and my husband's fatherly instinct who we knew, you know, that something was going on with her. We knew, you know, that she needed help and we fought and, you know, we really advocated for her and we were able to, you know, get things done for her. But one of the reasons we were able to do this is by being assertive, by speaking our minds you know I always say you know people really aren't going to play with their children so if you're not going to play with your child you most certainly are not going to play with mine because you know we we have dealt with biases in healthcare. I'm sure you guys know the the statistics and if you don't you can definitely look them up concerning you know bias in healthcare, you know concerning people of color, you know really having to a lot of times prove that something is going on with them just to get you know a standard workup or a basic workup we definitely dealt with some of that when Carl wasn't walking and we were trying to figure out what was going on you know Carl she did end up you know getting the proper care she did end up getting the things that she needs but she ended up getting a lot of those things after you know for lack of better words I had to show my tail but it's okay because I'll, I'll do it again it, it it was effective you know and and it got us you know some results so I really you know don't mean to ramble I just really wanted to let you guys know what's going on with us this week we appreciate you guys supporting us like I said if you're kind of just starting to follow her journey today then I do recommend that you check out vlog one which is titled the story of Carl you you can also find us on TikTok, on Instagram. Of course, we're on YouTube and we are on Facebook as well. And we really just want to be a resource to everybody. And I do want to say, and I'll say this every time, I am a physician, but with doing this vlog, I am not in the role of a physician. I am not in the role of an autism expert. I am simply a mom chronicling my journey with my daughter. And I also want to say that I am speaking for Carl Emery. I am speaking for the Edwards family, which is why we titled this vlog, Carl Emery's World, because the information within it is very much so specific to Carl. We love everybody in the autism community. We, we love you all. We understand that there are differences. We understand that, you know, we all don't have the same viewpoints, but I am definitely, I will definitely always respect everybody's viewpoints, even if I myself don't agree, because, you know, it is a spectrum and our kids are different. They all have different needs. And so we will never disrespect you guys by claiming to speak for the entire autism community because we know that we are not qualified to do that and we know that we all have our individual struggles and that our specific indi individual struggles are what are going to shape 
how we approach things. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for supporting Carl. You guys are amazing and we really, really appreciate it. If you guys want to connect, you can send me a message on um TikTok just at Carl Emery, which is C A R L E E M E R Y. You can also send me a message on Instagram, which is Carl C A R L E underscore Emery E M E R Y. Or you can send me a message on Facebook at Carl C A R L E Emery's E M E R Y apostrophe S world. W-O-R-L-D. Thank you, guys. Have a nice afternoon.